Thank you, Brooks, please. Yes, um, Brooks, Signal James Defense. Uh, I see two problems here. One, uh, separate pools of money where each institution controls that. Um, money is power, and money is the power to force the other side to use its equipment. So uh, maybe three of you could address that. And more important, um, before the military aims to cooperate with the civilian, shouldn't it be focusing on harmonized military requirements? And I do mean binding harmonized military requirements. Are the Nordics aiming for that? My short answer is yes, but um, the, uh, how, how, how the money uh, or the resources, how, how they are divided into the military and uh, the civilian parts is still, of course, a political question. And, uh, but at the same time, when, uh, when the polit clear pl political will now is within the, uh, the frame of the Lisbon Treaty, to create the external action service, uh, I, I, to a certain deg degree, uh, expect that uh, these two, two resource flows will have also an integration. But this is uh, on a political question that you're asking. But uh, I with the task, there is also a resource. I mean, that's so, so fundamental. This political question influences also the industry, because if you have a, a real single European market, this means that the, the European market will compare with, with the US or with China, with India. Until now, we have a We've had a European internal market for 20 years now. That's not really a European internal market. It's still a political question. But yes, it's a political question. This will help us. What I try to say. Hmm. <laughs> Harmonized military requirements? Should the EDA be pushing its members to do that? Should the capitals be considering it? I mean, you harmonize know, you know that we are doing it already, and that we are pushing our member states to harmonize their military requirements. But EDA is still very young. You are aware of it. Just five years, and it's a long process, a long endeavor, which needs uh, a long, long effort. But coming back to your question on separate sources or resources of money uh, and the potential of a power game, we have, for the time being, established a very pragmatic approach for this challenge. It is a challenge. And this pragmatic approach says that money stays within the institutional borders. Management competences stay within the institutional borders. But this is, for intermediate period of time, the, the right approach. I do not know by when we will be able to overcome this intermediate period, but for the time being, this is a practical solution to the problem. Just to make a short comment on, on, on the word harmonization. The, uh, uh, that is not uh, just a nice word for me. It's, um, it's very closely linked to interoperability. And uh, over the years, we have seen uh, uh, the operations in uh, Bosnia, in Chad, uh, and they own also Atalanta outside Somalia, and uh, a number of exercises. And this is nothing but harmonization, the, the result of uh, interoperability among many of the member states. We try to talk one la language, we have the same pr procedures, and all the equipment are also now uh, adaptable to each other. So, uh, and that, that is really something that is going on all, all the time, but I think we have come a long way. Yes, please, but we are really short in time. Yes, so. quick question from you, Observer, um, more institutional question. Um, the Lisbon Treaty also provides for this opportunity of uh, permanent structured cooperation between military capable states. I wanted to have the opinion of uh, each of the gentlemen here, especially for Mr. Rice, if that maybe a uh, short track, a fast track for, for military cooperation, would that undermine the EDA's reason of that? <laughs> um, 
the Spanish presidency has opted for a very prudent approach as far as permanent structured cooperation is concerned because the provisions on permanent structured cooperation have been written in 2000 and 2001 and EDA was established in 2004. So one could think that permanent structured cooperation, uh, I wouldn't say it is outdated, but it has maybe been already overtaken by the creation of the European Defence Agency. But EDA is not the trigger for a permanent structured cooperation. These are member states. Member states have to decide on which basis they would like to initiate a fast track approach for European cooperation, and we will uh, support them in this effort. The only thing I could say, I hope that, the, no, as uh, Mr. Weiss said in the beginning, they start to act, no? because until now we talk a lot, but we need some action. EDS is just the first step, but we need more. And I hope that the, the Lisbon Treaty no, will uh, help in you know, order to have a permanent structure able to, to follow in this particular aspect. Yeah, Pauline, uh, for your authority, for Mr. Weiss, you mentioned three areas where you're hoping to make practical progress. Um, that's on the unmanned aerial vehicles, on the IEDs, and on maritime surveillance. Can you elaborate on each of those three themes and where you hope to make this progress? I mean, as I said in my, uh, in my introductory remark, maritime surveillance is a topic which is currently addressed by EDA from a CSDP point of view. That means we are looking at capabilities for the Atlanta-type operations. Uh, but uh, maritime surveillance is also a topic under the broader subject, which is maritime safety and security, which is addressed by the Commission in, under the lead of DG Mare with support of DG Relex. Um, from our point of view, our work can contribute to the work of DG Mare and DG Relex, as our work is related to a specific topic, namely the CSDP-related capabilities. And a very concrete example how the two uh, processes could support each other is the following. Naval um, civil maritime authorities have national networks where they uh, provide each other with information about the maritime situation, very often at, in, in littoral sea areas. These networks are not accessible for military authorities. We could think to connect civil networks with military networks and vice versa to, ex to allow all maritime authorities to share their relevant information with each other. This is one of the topics. Uh, uh, counter IED is less mature, but IEDs are very much uh, present in the public discussion. If you think at Afghanistan in particular, IEDs are the most important threat to our uh, deployed staff and no matter if they are military or civilians. Uh, so I think there is room to address this uh, also at the EU level, also by a military-civil combined approach. UAS, I said it also in my introductory remark, UAS can fly over a military operational scenario, but they can also fly over a, the EU's external border to control immigration flows, so they are typically a dual-use piece of equipment. And therefore, there is an interest uh, at the border control agency Frontex uh, in Warsaw. There is uh, an interest for military operators to have UAVs. And all of them are facing the challenge that UAVs are only on an exceptional basis allowed to be inserted into the general air traffic. So we need to address together how we can allow UAVs to fly systematically in the general air traffic. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will continue on the other side. We will invite you to follow the signature. Thank you very much. Thank you.